but let, let's talk a little bit about that. Like Zoe, how she came to be. Um, I think visually she's just very striking, and so I'm kind of curious, like your favorite Zoe stories or just like her her origin story and and how everyone worked together. Okay, so Zoe, uh, every memory I have of us developing Zoe. Um, has to do with a lot of internal feedback because <laughs> a lot of internal feedback, yeah, because you know, I think that we can admit that we're pretty comfortable making the kind of like tough guy or assassin the or darker guy. character. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. by the way, me, me included, like I like I like Callista is one of my favorite thematics, so I'm not mm. excluding myself from that. <coughs> and I think that when we started thinking about Zoe, uh, the team felt that we were missing that bubbly fun, mm -hmm. uh, really happy, colorful champion in the mid lane, some, some champion that'd be reminiscent of, of Lux. And that we were long overdue for that and that our players really wanted that. So uh, Zoe went through a lot of different iterations, but um, she was always young mm -hmm. and she kind of got younger as it went on. And there was this, this feeling that she, what would be so fun is to have this small girl, that's the, that's the form she's chosen, she's a small girl, but she's actually, Oops. And yeah, she's <laughs> actually, I know, because I always use my eyes a lot. She's actually an ancient, powerful being. And um, <coughs> for the team, that was a big challenge. And one of the things that was challenging about it is that, you know, I, I love to tell the story of Rory, one of the animators, went over to his desk and he was like, I don't know. I don't know how to make, I don't know a little girl power fantasy. Like, what do I, <laughs> how do I do a little girl power <coughs> fantasy? I'm, I'm lost. It's like when I go home in my free time, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm doing like ninjas with swords and stuff. <laughs> this is really what Rory said. Right. And Gem and I started joking that we're going to buy tutus for all the animators so they could like, you know, get in really? touch with yeah. it. Yeah, I was like, you got to get in touch with a little girl. But they did do a lot of research and they did watch, um, they, they watched, I can't remember which movie they watched, it was a little girl dancing and looked for a lot of inspiration out there because they definitely wanted her to feel like she was powerful. Mm -hmm. And that she's she's having a blast, but that she can go toe to toe with Zed. Right. And that this is something she chooses, right? That's right. Uh, if you ever ever get a chance to play with her against Aurelian Soul, she uh, she talks to him like he's an angsty teenager. You know, she's she's this guy who can being, blow yeah. up universes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, but but I'll tell you, artistically getting her there, I will say we often would go past what we'd call like the line. You know, we'd push it pretty far, and then mm -hmm. we'd rein it back in. So yeah. there would be areas, for example, that I think were quite a bit of debate was around breaking the fourth wall. You know, giving her a jumping rope, giving her a yo-yo, right. that would be breaking the fourth wall. But we really felt like she had to have toys. So that what that became was, um, okay, she's this, um, you know, cosmic being. So she builds her toys out of the constellations, right? She can just pull the stars out of the air and she can form this beautiful jump rope and she can just skip all over the rift. Right. So this was some of the, the push and pull. But I think in the end where we landed, I would say internally there's still debate over whether or not we went too far as far as her co colorful bubbliness, you know, but for us, I would say, um, for many of us, we, we don't feel that way. We think she absolutely belongs in our world. Mm -hmm. And uh, personally, I'm really happy if we are still having debates right. on the floor about whether or not a champion went too far with their thematics, because that means that we're still trying to do new things. We're still pushing or keeping it fresh. Right. But certainly from our players, uh, we, we had a, a reflection of that feedback where we have people who are incredibly enthusiastic about her, like, yeah. I can't believe you guys it's did that. It's very polarizing. And then people who are like, <laughs> <coughs> what is going on with this uh, rainbow girl? Right. right. So we're kind of seeing both those things. So the seed crystal of the game that became War Marines of Edith Finch was my experience of scuba diving as a teenager. And the feeling I had of looking at the ocean floor sloping away into what seemed like an infinite darkness. And what I realized, like, you know, like the description of that that I, I came up with was that it was this encounter with the sublime of something that feels beautiful, but also at the same time overwhelming. So it's a, a moment that reminds you of how unknowable the universe is. And we started by making like a literal scuba diving simulator and realized that that you know, didn't, didn't really feel like the experience we wanted to. It felt a little bit too much, too much like a game. I think controlling a player or controlling a diver underwater is just a little too arbitrary and sort of put too much focus on the controls. Uh, so we started looking at a lot of other references for types of art that evoke the sublime. And the clearest uh, reference we found was this genre of literature called weird fiction, which is, uh, and that includes people like Neil Gaiman and H.P. Lovecraft, uh, and that kind of spun off into a bunch of short stories, and yeah, the game took off from there. Whenever we're casting people, I always try to cast non-actors 
or people that are really similar sounding to the characters that they portray. Uh, because I feel like for us, what we're interested in, in terms of the performance, is the sense of a human being. Like, we don't want to have a nuanced performance that makes players feel like, wow, that was a really difficult scene and that actor really rose to that challenge. Uh, you know, in a way that would be a little too distracting, like fireworks. Uh, so we'd rather have something that feels like like a handshake, like someone who, wow, like I feel like I met someone through their voice. And in listening to Valerie's performance, you know, it felt like, wow, she's really got a similar perspective on life, whatever that is that comes through in the voice, even just in her natural speaking voice. And she seemed like a good fit for Edith, where, you know, we didn't have to ask her, hopefully, you know, to jump through too many emotional hoops and she could, you know, just kind of quietly open up, especially important with a character like Edith, who isn't very demonstrative. You know, so you're really getting, in some ways, like a monotone performance, and the subtleties of that, I think, come through best when you have an actor who's already kind of working with the grain and going with their natural character. We made the decision really early on um, that we were, we were going to really focus on one, one character, one main character for the, for the story, um, and for her to be uh, a character that we really went to town on. So, Budgetary restrictions meant that we couldn't realize a whole cast of characters in the same way that we did Senua. But it was a restriction, but it also allowed us to go, let's really make Senua as realistic as possible. Let's make her the most realistic real-time character that there is out there. Mm -hmm. And that involved us working with some interesting partners, so three lateral out in Serbia, um, cubic motion as well to bring yeah. the facial animation to life. Um, so, yeah, th this image here is... Uh, I think this, this shows how close we got to actually so bringing, that, bringing Asta, Mel Asta, Melina to life. Asta looked development um, shot from uh, in the run-up to GDC 2016, um, with obviously the real photo of Melina on the right and Senior mm. uh, on the left. Uh, so the idea is um, you do a ground truth shoot of your subject, so in this case Melina, and, and you. If you're developing asset, normally you do a bunch of different shots, but this was a key light shot, so it's a very dark environment with a single very bright light. And it was very hot. It was, and you just got back on a flight from somewhere and you were yeah, massively jet-lagged. Yeah, I just got off the plane and then you put this And you've got like a thousand watt light here, and we'd take a shot and I would have to stand out and yeah. cool down and take a shot. <laughs> and we'd have to hang around the office for ages mm -hmm. and like wait till everybody left and like clear a mass of space out. Yeah, because it's like a, dim all the lights. Yeah, it's like a, what was it? It's like a six meter circle. And you put your subject in the middle, and then like you do an eight-point sh uh, shoot. So you, you do start the subject, and then you rotate the camera. And you will start the camera, and then you rotate the subject, right? Uh, okay. And then what you do is you, you recreate this light environment in, in Unreal Engine, right? And you calibrate the light in Unreal Engine to your um, lighting you know, in, the, in the physical shoot. And then you can, you can have your digital asset in UE4, and then you have your kind of equivalent shot from the shoot, which we have there. And then you, you know, you, you basically work on the digital asset, and you know, you, you make sure that your digital character is responding in light, uh, to light in the same way that you know your your ground truth reference is showing you. So that's what that is. Um, Mel, do you want to talk about Serbia? Serbia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, it happened really fast. So after I accepted the role. Um, we all flew to Serbia together to visit a company called Three Lateral, who um, specialize in face scanning. And Rigging. they have put me in like this massive UFO type sphere, like full of cameras. And I had to sit in there on a chair. I don't know how many, how many cameras do you have? I think, um, I think it was 90. But I mean, they've, they've, it felt like hundreds of cameras. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's, really that's, that's not very money like, yeah. now, but yeah. And then they had this iPad. 90 cameras all pointing at you, that's quite a few. <laughs> yeah, and they had this iPad in the middle of it so I could talk to people while I'm in the sphere because like, everyone was in a different room, so I was separate. And they, they were just calling me on Skype and telling me like, what to do while I'm sitting inside this UFO. Yeah. <laughs> so they were like, can you do this facial expression? And so how many, you had to do a whole bunch of facial expressions, right? Yeah, it must right? have been, been over 100 facial expressions. Yeah. Yeah. And split, I nailed all of them. Split into two. <laughs> yeah, no, that is the He actually like, did say yeah. I'm pretty good at them. You yeah. have a very well articulated <laughs> yeah. face. You're right, it's actually 106, <laughs> and we're going to go through them all now. I okay. think we've got time for that, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Slightly sad. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, the, the shoot itself splits two sections. So they, they, they do one set where you pull like a, 
like a very big overall um, expression, and then they take several shots of that one expression, but with a rotating light source. And I think there was, what, seven of those. But they're really difficult because you have to hold your, your facial expression while this kind of ring camera yeah, just goes off. Uh, the, the camera goes off with the, the rotating lights. Um, and we extract the um, texture maps from that. So like, And the uh, face mask. I had to yeah. wear a face mask. So, um, yep. Wrinkle well, maps and blood play maps. Not really a face mask. It's, it was a Tesco Dead Sea mask, <laughs> yeah. um, which I put on in the Senua style. And uh, oh no, who helped me? Somebody helped me to put it on. Um, Hugh. Yeah. 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 Um, and then we let it dry for like over an hour, I think. And then it gets these nice crackles, which you can see there. It looks really cool. But it really hurts. <laughs> <laughs> so it felt like my face was just like that all the time. So that's a good cosplay tip. Yeah. <laughs> you <want> to, get, <laughs> the, the, to get the legit thing, you need yeah. a nice. Budget, it has to hurt, then, then it's right, yeah. Yeah, other brands so. are available. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we, we really went to town on, on Senua, uh, and, you know, we had that restriction that we could only do one character. Um, but, um, you know, it did give us that ability to really go into a huge amount of detail on her. But, uh, so, to, to me, the creative director, um, co-founder of Ninja Theory, he, he hadn't really told anyone, but he still had in the back of his head, well, I'd still like to be able to see the other characters. And it was quite late on the project where he kind of, <laughs> kind of mentioned this. And he's like, oh, well, I'd still like to see them. And it's like, well, you know, we can't, we don't have the resources to do kind of a Senua job with these characters. So, so just so, the point on that, like, none of the, all of the enemies, like, none of them have facial features. Yeah. For, yeah. Good, for good reason. Like, yeah. the reason is <laughs> because doing a facial setup and then because you then have to animate it, right? So it was sort of a creative choice, but also kind of. So this kind of uh, kind of landed on you pretty much, Mark. Yeah, and I've. That's because everybody else has passed the buck. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh... I have to admit, like I definitely just thought it was a terrible idea. I was like, to me, this is never going to work. Yeah. It's going to look like Mad Dog McCree or something. Yeah. Um, for the older people in the audience, <laughs> might remember that. Much um, older people. F FMB <laughs> in games is not. What is FMB? Yeah. It's got a pretty. Yeah. Cool. We're like, there's no way we can get away with FMB, but like we had no other option really. Yeah. Um, so, like, I just had to take this footage and just start playing with the effects and post and Fix stuff. It, and post. Yeah, Balash, our cinematics lead, did some After Effects work on it just to try and match up lighting. Um, but I remember something um, Professor Paul Fletcher, who we'll talk about a bit later on, mm. um, when he was talking about um, people that have flashbacks and stuff, he always mentioned that they were kind of not in focus and you kind of couldn't really kind of have a pinpoint sort of view of it. So. I just chucked on like loads of depth of field, like just started phasing the lights in and out, and just basically tried to blur the footage as much as possible so no one could tell it was FMV. And it kind of worked in yeah. In so most so, of the so we just shot it. We shot it on a on a green screen that wasn't green. That was red. It was um, <laughs> and um, because we hadn't, we, so we couldn't find the green screen. We couldn't find the green screen. And then we had my housemate Jess make all the costumes so like last minute. All the costumes. Yeah. That, yeah. that skull he's wearing. That's the skull I found on a dog walk. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we had some like feathers. I don't know what we were using. Yeah. And we, so so we, we kind of shot it and then. <laughs> Kind of yeah, kind of threw that footage at Mark, and yeah, and I think everyone in the team was like, "You've seen like live action in games before, right? Like, are you sure we want to do this?" And no one really believed in it. But I mean, this is the theme with with what well, with the game, but with Tamim as well. It's like let's push, let's push it, let's try it, let's try and do it quickly and see if it works. And don't mention who, the end of Enslaved. Who? No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think you just did. Oops. Um, who was it who came on the playtest and Tim was like, is he going to mention it? It was Game Informer. So actually, yeah, we had, um, so the first time we showed this to anyone was when Game Informer, you know, the, the biggest games magazine in the world, uh, came in, uh, other magazines are available. Um, they, 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 they came in to do a, a cover story. So we, we, we spoke to them about doing a cover story and it was a big thing for the game for, the, for them to come in. And it was like, well, let's, let's show it to them and see if they notice. So it was the first time they, they played it. And then they'd been playing the game and no one was really in the room. And it's like, they're going to get to this bit. And then there was suddenly loads of people in the room and they got through it and then they turned around and it's like, yeah, yeah, we, we like it. It's like, we're just waiting. They haven't noticed, right? Everyone go, no, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> they, they haven't noticed. So that was the real, the real test for it. But, you know, it's just a really good example of where you might go, no, this isn't going to work. But actually having that attitude of, well, how, how do you know? Let's just try it. Let's try it quickly and, yeah. you know, and, and see if we can make it happen.
When we first announced the game, which was really early in development, uh, with a trailer, like the, the response was not good. There was a really bad online reaction against the game. They felt like the game strayed too far from the original Devil May Cry. But that is exactly what Capcom wanted us to do. They wanted us to stray. There was a lot of criticism and mistrust because we weren't Capcom. We were a Western developer doing this game. There was no faith at all in our ability to deliver. A real backlash, like hundreds and hundreds of messages being sent to the studio. We got death threats, we got threats of violence, we got you know, a torrent. All that stuff is now is pretty common. That was like a, the first massive blowback, I'd say, from a product announcement of this nature. And this is all before anyone had actually you know, seen a second of gameplay or laid hands on the game. And that just kept going and going. The media got involved as well. It's like it turned into a snowball effect. You know? Everyone in the world decided that this was going to be a failure of a game. Most of the abuse came my way. I was the creative director, so I was responsible. And the rest of the team could just get on with it. You know? The only response to something like that is to do your job, which is what we did. When we started to show gameplay and people were showing you know, what you could do in the game, consensus shifted from, OK, so maybe the game's all right, but it's not Devil May Cry. And it's still not going to be good. It's not going to be good as the rest. When the game was released and it started to get really great reviews, a lot of people then started to give the game a chance. And then as more and more people, just through word of mouth, got into the game, um, it ended up selling incredibly well, like as, as good as any of the, you know, the best of the DMC series. And it was rated as high as the best of the DMC series. So there was this kind of uh, quiet satisfaction that despite all the negativity that was surrounding the game, we did the right thing, which was to focus on the job that we had to do, that Capcom wanted us to do, and deliver on the quality of game that they expected of us. We didn't change direction, we stuck to the vision that we set out to at the start, and um, I think that's just given us a lot of strength and confidence in the long run, because, you know, the world didn't end. Uh, as a big movie lover, I understand that you also try and, and watch a film every day as well. It's, 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 it's very much a habit of yours, and it's, it's well known you've long harbored a desire to make a movie yourself. So I'm just wondering what's, what's stopping you making a movie and um, uh, what, what sort of story would you like to tell on film and, and your experience as a games designer, what, would you, what do you think you would bring to the big screen? Well, if I go back to my roots, you know, originally I entered the game industry because I wasn't able to enter the film industry, you know, and I, I love film. But once I started creating games, I realized that, you know, games are really fascinating. And, uh, you know, needless to say, I think uh, most people in the audience know that as far as movies based on games up until this point, there haven't been any success stories. And I think one of the reasons for that is that, you know, games are an interactive medium. So really, you know, they create a scenario, you know, setting for the player to interact with, but there's not really a compelling story there for a lot of games. And then, of course, what happens is Hollywood sees that the, the games are popular, they try to pick it up, and they create a story and try to basically force a story onto that game. Um, and in the end, it doesn't work because you end up with something that's neither the game nor a good movie, you know, so fans of the original game won't be satisfied and movie lovers won't really be satisfied with it either, so it doesn't really hit any particular target. Uh, you know, and so that's the problem that I'm trying to remedy with the upcoming Metal Gear Solid movie. And uh, I hope you have confidence uh, in that movie because I feel it will turn out well. Um, there's a lot of, as you've acknowledged, a lot of turkeys um, that have been turned out based on uh, movies based on video games. Uh, are, there, are there any um, films that you think have actually done a good job of conveying uh, a, a gaming experience on the big screen? <laughs> Honestly, I can't think of any. <laughs> I think, you know, as far as uh, game movies that have done well, I guess Tomb Raider was, was pretty good, as far as sales are concerned. <laughs> but Metal Gear is going to be a masterpiece. Oh, yeah, so we're not going to make a Metal Gear with no action or anything like that. <laughs> when you look at the video games industry as it is today, um, what excites you um, about it and what, what frustrates you, what, what, what disappoints you? I guess you can say that well, one thing that I'm not really satisfied with is that most of the games that are released these days tend to be very similar. 
Um, even if it's not a sequel, uh, you know, the stories and settings that are in the games are very similar to other games and what have come before, so it's not very creative. But I do believe that games have the potential to achieve something that neither movies nor novels can achieve. You know, it's a unique form of storytelling. And I think that, you know, game creators should really strive for that. And I believe that's, you know, should be the mission of all game creators out there is to create this new, unique form of storytelling and explore it to its fullest. Um, and I think the users as well, players want that. And uh, I believe really that it's my mission to provide that for them.